All right, welcome guys to the Independent Creatives Podcast. My name is Wes. I'm a comic book artist and illustrator. Uh, today I have my friend Hector with me. Uh, Hector, can you give us a brief introduction? Uh, sure. Yeah, my name is uh, Hector Moran. I'm a digital artist uh, focused on mostly character sculpting. And uh, I'm originally from Mexico and uh, I live these days in Austria. So um, I kind of started uh, my career a little bit in the U.S. when I was uh, going to uh, university there. Um, actually, art college. Uh, and um, eventually I went back to Mexico for a while and I got my first job offer in, in Europe in the Netherlands for uh, an outsourcing studio. This was um, about 20 four years ago by now. So it was in the early 2000s, basically, that I graduated. And then in 2005 was my, when I got my first uh, studio job offer in the Netherlands. That was basically what brought me here to, to Europe. And now I've been in Europe longer than I, I lived in Mexico or anywhere else. Um, first in the Netherlands uh, for a few years, then uh, a year in Germany, and now I've been in Austria for more than 10 years now, so it's been a while. And, um, during my art career, I've done a bit of everything as far as uh, related to characters and, and digital uh, sculpting with ZBrush. So it's, I've done a bit of uh, video game art. Uh, I've done a bit of uh, a lot of miniature sculpting for 3D printing, a, a few toys, uh, and a few statues. So it's uh, a bit all over the place uh, where my career has uh, taken me, both geographically, geographically, and also as far as the projects that I've uh, gotten to work on. Yeah. So I'm sharing my screen right now. Um, and I'm flipping through your art station. And uh, yeah, man, like I, I really dig your work. There's something about the expression on this guy's face that uh, just it, it, it's uh, it's really funny to me because I, I feel like I can tell that you made it. I, I don't know how to explain <laughs> that, but I can see your personality in it. Yeah. And uh, <laughs> it's, it's really <laughs> this was a this was the men in black. Uh, uh, yeah, it's, it's like a like crossover it. miniatures game with uh, Ghostbusters, and the style was Chivis done in the style of uh, an artist called Derek Laufman. And uh, okay. the, like this, specifically this set of character, this subset of characters was was just a lot of fun because uh, Frank, the the pug, is just yeah. such a fun character, and then Jeeves, uh, <laughs> uh, Jeeves is played by the actor that played later in Monk, that TV show. Uh, that was yeah. one of the first movies I saw that guy in, and he, he played this guy where his eyes were everywhere. And uh, mm -hmm. like this, <laughs> yeah. this shady dealer of alien goods, and that's the cartoony <laughs> version of him. And like, that's just so much fun. <laughs> yeah. I love and that, then the man. warm guys, the warm guys were also great. Like, they're just sitting in an office drinking coffee and breaking. <laughs> Yeah, man, these look like look like you had a lot of fun with these. So you, so I also have your your book because okay, so uh, for people that for people that are watching, I I guess I'll say that I met you at THU uh, this last year. We went to Japan. We had an awesome time. You were you were really cool and a huge inspiration to me because you gave me you gave me your book here. <laughs> and uh, no lie, man, I'll I'll go through here and I'll flip through this stuff and I'll be like looking at it and i'm not a 3d guy um but i love the design of your of everything it is that you do in 3d and i can see that there was like a major uh a major evolution that happened with your work when you went from 2d to 3d or were yeah. you always like a 2d and a 3d guy at the same time and were they both kind of like feeding off of one another or did you start out 2d and then you went 3d uh definitely they feed off of each other uh i think when i really started early on with art was kind of thanks to my dad because my dad was mm -hmm. uh by, by profession he studied to be an engineer but he ended up more working in logistics but he he had a bit of a gift for or interest for drawing 
and uh, whenever I had like these little projects in school, like elementary school, like elementary. where I needed a poster of something, like some old historical figure or something, like he would draw me the portrait of the historical figures. And at one point, when I was like four or five, he, he like I was playing with Play-Doh and all these kinds of plasticines that children are given to play with. And and he picked it up and he just made a human body out of one. Like basically just a, it had legs, it had arms and it had a head and like it had mittens for hands, like not even any fingers. But but when I saw that uh, as a kid, my my dad doing that, I was like, oh, there's something here, you know, like that fascinated me. And that kind of got me really into um, one of the toys. One of my favorite toys to get that was not even a toy was just this little boxes of plasticine that had 10 bars in it, 10 colors, basically. So it had all the primary colors, brown, black, and a few others. And with that, I basically would create like fan art of whatever thing I was into at a time. So like I made little Thundercats, little uh, figurines of all kinds of things that were interesting when, uh, when I was a kid. And um, I think also around the age and there was before that it was like mostly doodling most of that uh, i think the plasticine was more was what i used more for a while and then at some point i did pick up a pencil and started drawing a lot of ninja turtles for example and uh, and i think at some point when the when the movie came out that was i think 89 or so, so i was about nine years old and i started drawing ninja turtles all the time everywhere <laughs> so somewhere between ninja turtles and later it was x-men the x-men cartoon like i just started yeah. a whole kind of period of mostly drawing you know and i kind of dropped the clay mm -hmm. for a while um but then again when i was around 16 or, or maybe 17 i picked up the clay again for a while so it was always a bit of back and forth like 2d and 3d then when eventually I went to, to study, I was actually living in the U.S. Uh, during that time because my dad had a, had a job there. And uh, I did high school in the U.S. in Laredo, Texas. And when it was time to pick up something to study, uh, I, I think it was around the time when Toy Story came out. So I became aware of like, oh, what is this computer animation thing? It means you can do stuff with like the characters with the computer. So that was that was pretty interesting, and then I started looking into schools that basically had computer animation as a major, and I ended up uh, getting a scholarship in a school in Miami, and basically that's what I studied in the U.S. It was computer animation, so that's what basically got me into 3D and into Maya back then. It was just before ZBrush, and then around 2007 was when I first picked up ZBrush, and Basically, it was ZBrush that, because even during my game art career, I was still doing character design and 3D for the studio that I worked for. And uh, but when ZBrush came out, I started really refocusing and specializing on 3D and sculpting and sculpting characters. And that was kind of like what basically made me very specialized in, in characters in, in 3D. Um, and Basically, since, since around 2012, uh, I became pretty heavily specialized on in ZBrush and in 3D character sculpting. And I've kind of abandoned the, the 2D quite a bit. Like every now and then, I'll still pick up a pencil and a sketchbook and just do something. But uh, um, it, it, it kind of became both out of interest and also to an extent out of survival, like just basically like get really good at this sculpting thing and just kind of get the jobs that come with it and and then what else like happens or becomes available. But every every time that I that I basically kind of did one or the other for a while and I would come back like if I did drawing for a while and I come back to I brought back something to to it. Uh, mm -hmm. and the other way around also. So did you, did it feel like whenever you came across ZBrush and you started to get into ZBrush, did things like finally, like, do you feel like that was a time when things clicked for you? Like you had been collecting these skills in a sense, and then they all kind of just synergized whenever you hit ZBrush. You're like, this is what I'm supposed to be doing. 
Uh, sort of. Like, it was a bit of a slow click with ZBrush because I did fight the interface for a few years. <laughs> and okay. but at some point, the interface fully clicked with me and the, the features that they kept adding to it, it became a really full package to where I didn't really need to go back to Maya. Mm -hmm. And at that moment, and I think it was around 2012 that that, that, that also happened. Because in 2012 was also when I went full time freelance. Like, I... Just, uh, went away from studio life, and uh, and I joined. Uh, I, I I left the like um, working in, in in house in a studio, and I just went full freelance. And uh, yeah, it was also because a lot of the clients that I had for freelance were three D print project clients, so that basically uh, translated into really focusing in ZBrush and and becoming really specialized in it. And and I, I didn't I didn't end up minding it because I've gotten a lot out of it, like just kind of making that those quality jumps that I've been able to make just by really focusing on it. And also along with that it's also been a a, a focusing and refocusing of things like fundamentals, anatomy, like things like that. Um, it was a few years ago when, when I um, got the project to do the Street Fighter miniatures. And when I did those, um, I started the project being like, yeah, I know anatomy. I've been into anatomy books all my life. I know what's going on. Mm -hmm. and, uh, <laughs> and when I was doing those those miniatures, I was like, oh, man, I don't know as much anatomy as I really should. And, and like, I'm not as good at like, knowing certain parts of, of the body as, as well as I would like to. Like, there are parts like the back and the forearm um, mm -hmm. where I was like, oh, I really need to kind of, like, study this deeper. So I ended up taking up the Scott Eaton anatomy course. And that just really helped mm -hmm. me for for kind of securing or, 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 like, feeling a lot better about, like, what I was doing with anatomy. Because there's always good reference that you can look at. and but if you know what's going on under the skin and like basically down to the bone to an extent, um, mm -hmm. you will you will feel a lot more confident about what you're doing with the with the surface level, and especially when you're talking about making characters in pose. Like the the body can change so much in subtle or in very obvious ways uh, when you when you have a character in a different pose. Yeah. Yeah, I can I can tell you upped your game with with the anatomy stuff. With the I mean, like to to be able to sculpt something like this bison, mm -hmm. and for it to actually for it to actually look like the clothes are conforming to his body, but they're not like it's not like he has like a six pack on his on his you know jersey or whatever. Um, <laughs> you know, I imagine, I, I think that takes like a finesse that you only get from years and years of doing this. Like these look incredible, man. <laughs> yeah. And, and, uh, but it, it was also like a joy to make, like the street fighter is definitely a very hyper stylized kind of like, uh, yeah. project, like, but, but that's what I wanted, like, uh, because these characters, they have clothing on, but all of their muscles are so tense and so pronounced that you still read them entirely when they have, like, with all of yeah. their clothing on. Unless it's really loose, like the shorts there on Sagat and, and things like that. Yeah. But basically, like, and you have to exaggerate both things. You exaggerate the wrinkles on the clothing, the, the tension, the stretching on the clothing, and then also, mm -hmm. like, the tensing on the muscles, like... All of their veins are popping out all the time, so so yeah, it's 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 uh it's kind of and it's also like you, you when you are when you're looking at references, you kind of realize like how much you're stylizing. You, you see in a, in like in real people, even the bodybuilders, there's there's a certain percentage of fat that you have that that is always kind of gonna fade away certain shapes depending on the pose and the tension level mm -hmm. um but with street fighter everything is on 100 percent all the time uh and but that's just really fun it's also like what superheroes are basically like superheroes yeah. um, in american comics are like they're just naked dudes and naked girls 
with every muscle and every basically part of their body kind of showing, except that it's color different, you know. And maybe every now and then you'll put a few wrinkles of like where the outfit is really tight on them. <laughs> but uh, but yeah, like that's that's I think that's also been my fascination since I was 12 years old with with uh, IPs like Street Fighter. I was like, oh man, this is so cool. The the anatomy and and you learn so much because a lot of these guys like. That, that were the designers for, for Street Fighter and a lot of these Capcom projects, like they were really pushing proportion, style. Like they they were drawing these huge hands with like big knuckles and all of this, and it was just a really kind of ex uh, cool exaggeration that they were doing. And yeah, like for for me to get this project, I really wanted to do it justice. So I kind of went to school for it a bit again. Like I took that online course. To just kind of deepen anatomy and i've been like kind of digging deeper still uh ever since then like i've i've been trying to to improve uh on all of that because that that's always been like the the most uh, fun like when i was drawing the most fun thing for me to draw was people like just humans mm -hmm. and sometimes monsters but mostly like people like male and female superheroes or whatever character was interesting at a given time Mm -hmm. yeah yeah the the anatomy is 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 on another level i mean i, I can tell that you really went to school with this what what did, what was the course that you said that you took what, what uh scott eaton uh he's he's pretty known or pretty popular for being a, an online anatomy teacher and uh okay. he has he has different courses for like 2d and 3d artists um uh, and they they kind of, he goes into different kinds of depth and in, in the different ones that he has. Um, I think the one that I took from him it was even like the one of like more 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 for two D artists than for three D artists. But I like for me that one was uh, pretty good because what he showed and what he explained in in those sessions. Uh, it was really helpful just to understand uh, like what's going on uh, in the body, like the the mechanics of it, and how how basically muscles interact with bones to move them around. Basically, like the muscle system is a pulley system for the skeleton, which is the scaffolding that basically holds us together. <laughs> You know, and uh, but but like understanding how how all of that kind of works together is it's fascinating in one level, like because it's it's really cool to to understand biologically and organically what's going on, like how the mm -hmm. hell we move, uh, and mm -hmm. uh, and how biology kind of developed all of these things inside of us, like starting from a human eyeball and everything that an eyeball can do. Uh, all the way down to, to the complexity of, of a shoulder, for example, which is like a mechanism that like, yeah, we understand that to be just the arm here, but like there's the, there's the clavicle and there's the, there's the scapula, the shoulder blade. It's, it's a really complex movement system for that. Um, and we have a very specific configuration of it that is different from how, lo how a lot of animals have it. So all the, like just knowing a lot of these things, it's it's fascinating on a nerdy kind of understanding level, but it's mm -hmm. also very useful if this is what you're kind of doing. Yeah, yeah, it's it's really fascinating because I, I think that as an artist, you're always kind of you're always pushed to learn stuff about uh, life. Like ultimately, mm -hmm. the thing it is that you're studying is always going back yeah. to to studying life itself. And like you were saying, you know, the anatomy, you you start to see how incredibly intricate it is because you think you understand it on one level, but it's like you could never, you can never fully master it, right? I mean, no, it, I, it can I, be convincing to someone, but, you know, you take a, you take some time off from, from trying to uh, expand your understanding and all of a sudden you start to get rusty and you start being like, well, wait, is this what it looks like, you know? Do yeah. You, whenever you do like your, whenever you were learning and you were trying to translate what you were learning into 3D, uh, what was your what was your process for doing that? Were you like, uh, I'm assuming in ZBrush you can have like your you can have your mold, and then you can basically put like you can put photos on like the X and Y axis, right? So you can mm -hmm. you can have like reference photos of 
of like an arm uh, yeah. from different angles, right? And then you can you can use that as your guide for sculpting. Is that the way you approached it, or do you do you just like look at reference and then go like try to do it and then figure out where you were wrong before? Mm. It, it, it's a bit of both, basically. Like I, when you're a beginner, you definitely need model sheets to stick to. So you need a profile yeah. and, a, and a front view, and you're kind of lining things up, and you're sort of 3D tracing what you're what you're aiming for. Uh, but then at some point, like you might not have a three quarter view that you can perfectly line up. So you have to kind of guesstimate the three quarter view. And this this is a lot harder when you're starting in 3D. Like a kind of like coming from from 2d and and kind of doing this in 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 a program like maya is its own kind of like learning curve because of course when i was doing it with clay like i was just doing it here in space in my hands yeah not mine. like you can try to line it up to an image or something and maybe see how you're doing uh, but it's still kind of very freehand very free form in your hand it's just a ball of clay and you're shaping it uh, mm -hmm. like good luck trying to have perfect symmetry also with that because you're just eyeballing the symmetry in 3d you get the symmetry for free but then at some point you also if you're doing realism you at some point have to break that symmetry because in nature nothing is fully symmetric uh so so you kind of do a lot of this uh, back and forth the way that i work these days i i don't really need a side view and a front view of, of uh, a lot of things that i work on like if a, if a client sends me a three-quarter uh, angle concept art and it's just that one concept art and there's no additional views, like I have enough experience translating and kind of working in 3D inside of ZBrush to where I don't need schematic views. I can work from, with, with one view and I can make any kind of angle just out of my own experience and out of my own mental library. I can fill in the blanks pretty easily. And then at some point, I will still kind of load up the, the reference into ZBrush and put it in the background and then just check how things are lining up. And for the most part, I'm pretty good at like kind of just eyeballing a lot of that early process and then just kind of like securing it later uh, by comparing it with the source material. Um, and it, it, to an extent, it, it still ends up being a sort of 3D tracing that you do depending on how close you want to be to the concept. Um, and then there are projects where it's more freeform, like Street Fighter, for example. Um, I ended up doing, uh, along with the, the client was uh, Angry Joe, uh, a YouTuber, and, uh, and mm -hmm. Dasco. So the between this, this studio that was doing the, that was going to be producing the miniatures and, uh, and Angry Joe, uh, who was kind of directing uh, a lot of the, the projects, um, we would kind of like pick the pose that we wanted to do. And in some cases for some of the Street Fighter characters, there wasn't a specific concept art that we were kind of, like fully based on. Like some of the poses are in the game, but they're like in old pixel art and like you can kind of like get something out of it, but but then you still have to adapt a lot. So so yeah, and, and the good thing for me has been that um, since I did a lot of 2D art, uh, in my time, and I also did a bit of character design. I, I'm pretty good at filling in the blanks for whatever kind of project I'm dealing with. So, like, the the client can come to me and and say, like, we want this character, but we want it in this completely different pose. There's no that there's no reference for in the game. Like, maybe it's a reference from someone actually doing martial arts and like take this character and this pose and just put them together yourself you know? and like that's um that's easy enough for me to do at this point because again a lot of experience making stuff yeah yeah so the the 2d and the 3d have definitely like built off of one another in terms of just like your skill set in general i love i love these like these chibi <laughs> the, the chibi spidey this is really cool. Oh, yeah. That's, uh, these yeah. are based on the art style of a friend of mine from Mexico. Yeah. Those, <laughs> <laughs> All right, I remember we were talking uh, in Japan, and and I, I think you said that, like, the, the chibi stuff, whenever you started to do that, like, that brought a lot more attention to you. Was that was that correct? Like, when you started to do, like, 
like fan art um fan art for stuff. sure was it? Uh, sure. fan art is mm -hmm. uh, something that um i think there's there's of course all kinds of uh opinions on fan art but uh at mm -hmm. least my personal opinion and my personal experience in fan art is that one it was always a ton of fun to do uh mm -hmm. two it was pretty good for making auditions to basically maybe ending up working on an actual official project um, mm -hmm. and um and three in social media it's a pretty good way to get some eyeballs on your work because it's harder to get eyeballs on your work if you're making original characters that no one has seen before Whereas if, yeah. you, if you're just making a little kind of fan art of Deadpool or one of these characters that everyone kind of knows, um, if, if you do a good take on it, like people will basically like it and it will get some eyeballs on your work. And then you could kind of steer those eyeballs to maybe whatever other kind of work you want people to see from you. you know? um, so fan art can be a funnel. For, for you to bring bring people into looking at other works of yours that you might want them to, to see. Uh, this, for example, was Darksiders. And th this was also a big deal to me um, because uh, since I was like, I don't know, about 14, 15 years old, um, mm -hmm. I was really into X-Men. And at some point, this artist came into X-Men. His name is Joe Madureira, Joe Mad. And mm -hmm. yep. he was the guy that started bringing a little bit of anime and Street Fighter flavor into American comics. He was, I think he was, he's one of the biggest, most underestimated art style influences that there's been in, in decades. Um, because I, I think a lot of what he did with X-Men and a lot of what he did with mixing East and Western kind of uh, pop, um, pop culture art styles uh, for comics, I think a lot of what he did ended up influencing even other things like World of Warcraft. And, and of course, Warcraft has its own influences that come from Warhammer and all these things that inspired it. Um, but um, I think Joe Matt is, is, is one of these big synthesizers that basically brought East and West together in a really successful mm -hmm. way and it was, it was great to see it in x-men and it was a big influence on me and i just followed his career since because uh, another thing that was a big deal to me about joe matt was uh, reading interviews about him in, in magazines about comics and just learning that he broke into marvel at 16 years old and and me just being some dumb kid that i was also like 15 or something uh, that loved comics I was like, oh man, it's possible to break into Marvel when you're really young if you're really good, and uh, like that just that just gave me a lot of hope. Of course, I never broke into comics or, or anything like that, but um, it was one of those stories that just sounded like, oh man, and if, if a young guy can do all this cool shit, like maybe I have a shot at doing cool shit too. And uh, so I followed his career all these years, and and eventually he made Darksiders, which was. Uh, what he did when he basically fully moved into video games and, and mm -hmm. so it was an original ip that he created and uh, there were several games in that franchise and um, i was i got kind of lucky basically i i kind of knew the right person um, and i got the call to maybe do the board game for for dark siders all the figures and basically yeah it was like getting paid to do fan art <laughs> Because uh, I did all of the figures from from that project and uh, had a blast making them. Like, they're so gnarly, like that big jailer that with the big blob on him. <laughs> it was a hell of a project to take on, also as far as that that guy himself, because he has all these skulls and all these tumors all over him. Oh yeah, I imagine this. I imagine this could easily turn into a nightmare if you don't know what you're doing dealing with like all this complexity and then having to manage how that's going to be printed. You know, like I, I assume you just can't go like balls to the wall with everything. Like there has to be specific considerations, especially yeah. when you're doing something that's, yeah, that's going to be mass printed. Right. 
Yeah, yeah, yeah. They're they're definitely like at, at the point that I did that one, I had a bit of a, a good bit of experience, and I kind of just structured the way that I put it together in a way that was gonna work for the three D printing and the casting. But but yeah, even then, the factory still did some adjustments to to it. But it was yeah, this whole project yeah. was a ton of fun. This looks incredible. This <laughs> oh man. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, I'm a huge fan of Joe Mad too. You know, we were talking about, um, you know, the Capcom versus Marvel games before we started recording. Was he the was he the artist for Capcom versus Marvel? For no, Marvel but the Capcom? artist from uh, basically there's, there's artists uh, like and and a lot of these Japanese artists they go by handles. Like almost no one knows yeah. their real names, uh, but there are some yeah. artists like Akiman and Bengus. That was the nicknames that they used to have for themselves. And I, at, at some point when I was reading interviews about Joe Matt, I, I, I read about him calling these guys by these handles. Like, yeah, Akiman was a big influence on me and Bengus was a big influence on me. So, so definitely, like, there's, um, there's a link there as far as, like, how these guys influenced guys like Joe Matt, basically. Yeah, Joe, Joe Mad's a huge inspiration to me too, just because he he does his own thing, you know. Like he broke into comics with, uh, you know, he broke into Marvel when he was very young, but then he's gone on to do Dark Siders, and then now he's doing Battle Chasers, right? He's doing his own, he's doing his own Battle thing Chasers, now. And now he his studio did a recent project called Wayfinder. It's a whole MMO actually so oh so, yeah. yeah like he's he's been pretty active and doing all kinds of cool projects for several years in video games yeah so i guess he's moved more into like doing uh game design than actually illustration and uh yeah he's an art well, director I guess basically he's the creative director so uh it, when you when you reach that point and that level, uh, is it, and I learned this while working in video games myself. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, you 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 hear about things like art director when you're in school, and you you sound that sounds so cool, like art director, like oh that's a cool <laughs> title to have and like it's something to aim for. Uh, but depending on the situation, uh, you might end up in a, in a case where art director just means that you're in a lot of meetings and your brushes are people, <laughs> basically. <laughs> and, uh, and you're kind of just mentoring them and directing them to do art and you end up doing very little art yourself. Um, and you also end up doing a lot of like business and other kinds of things. I, I think Joe Mad still draws quite a bit. But I think he's basically in that kind of situation where his brushes are people. So it's it, he has a whole team under him that is doing uh, the artwork for the projects. A lot of the the projects that he works on, of course, are basically done in his art style. But I, I think he's uh, he's uh, he's drawing and designing a lot less than, than he used to when he was uh, more more active as a, as a full-time artist. And that's just, I think that's just the nature of, of things also, like how some of these things progress. Yeah, yeah. I mean, he, he put himself into a position of high leverage so that he could take this vision he has of a game and put it out there. And there's always going to be a cost for something like that, right? Like you can't do everything. Um, yeah. Because he's he's the one basically directing the ship where it's going to go, yeah. and and whatnot. Yeah, I, it's it's really cool to see people do their own thing and to like put themselves into like so many different so many different areas. That's that's always what's inspired me, you know, like like Todd McFarlane or yeah. um, you know Kojima or any of these people that just have like they have their singular vision. Mm -hmm. And they they have the balls to like put it out there. Yeah, uh, it's just it's so it's so inspiring because you you realize that, or I guess what I've gotten from it is is that uh, in a lot of ways creativity is kind of bigger than you. It's a, it's yeah. almost like these people are are channeling something. And it's like it was. It comes in at the right time and meets with the right audience. Mm -hmm. You know what I'm saying? Like it, it, it feels it feels bigger than like 
I think a lot of artists can relate to this. It's not like a like an egotistical thing at all. I don't I don't look at it as that. I think it's very humbling to to start to understand that like the art is almost kind of being channeled through you whenever it is that you make something that's like really from your heart. And you see, like I said, like you see that it extends it extends beyond you. You know, it becomes yeah. a part of like your experience of life in a sense. Yeah, I mean, it's. I think it's the bigger the project, the more people you're gonna need to to make it happen. You know, so mm -hmm. so that's why. But but uh, I think some of the best projects are still the vision of one or very few people. That's why Star Wars, when it was good, it was mostly the vision of George Lucas. Uh, and then I've been I've been getting back a lot into into anime and manga, and a lot mm -hmm. of the best anime and manga is basically the vision of one guy you know it's yeah uh, attack on titan it's uh, hajime sayama it's it's his vision he wrote it he drew it and then of course to make the anime happen a bunch of people come in a whole studio of people comes in to basically make the anime happen in the, in the case of attack on titan it was actually two studios because they changed studio in between but still it's an army of people but that army of people is working on the vision of this, of this guy, Isayama, who basically had a really cool vision for a story that he put together. And uh, uh, Shonen Jump and the, the other publishers that make these anthologies and like, these, these manga uh, collections in, in Japan, um, I think some of these publications are like a big gladiator arena. And it's tough as hell in there. And that, but then from that, you get people like uh, Horikoshi, who did uh, My Hero Academia, and that's that's basically one of the the, the mangas that rose out of the, the past uh, ten years to kind of become an anime. And now My Hero Academia, it turned I think it turned ten years old recently, and uh, they're on their seventh season uh right now uh, i'm i'm watching it i'm following it and i'm a big fan of, of the mangaka that uh, that did it kohei horikoshi uh, this guy like not only he's a really good writer for these properties that are they're basically for children they're the, the it's in the name of, of what it is shonen manga and shonen anime it's anime mm -hmm. and manga for young boys and um, mm -hmm. but these guys are really good at doing this kind of entertainment and uh but not only that like some of them are also really good artists in their own like um like the 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 way that um that horikoshi draws is it's so good so full of life so full of energy um so yeah i think like some of the some of the highest level creators that i've observed in, and my 40 some years uh, on the planet are actually mangaka and and mm -hmm. some of the and some of the american artists that have also been writers like frank miller i think those are yeah. the highest form of creators that i've seen um mm -hmm. out there. Do you, yeah do you there's good writers the like there's Stephen king and there's chuck palanuk mm -hmm. and all kinds of writers that make really great books and really great fiction R. Martin and, and, and the likes of that. Then there's really good artists like Jim Lee, uh, Alan, um, Silvestri, um, all of these artists from the 80s, 90s, and like from wherever you may want to look at. And there are a few artists out there that are the full package of both, like being a really great draftsman and artist, and then also an amazing writer. I think Frank Miller, when he was in his prime in the 80s and 90s, like doing uh, The Dark Knight Returns and 300 and even Sin City. Like Sin City started really pushing the boundaries of what I could say to the young artist as far as like, ah, oh, this starts to look kind of ugly or weird. But, but no, it was just him experimenting, like really pushing what he could do as far as turning a graphic novel into graphic design like marv and marv and the rain like it it kind of crosses this order between a comic book illustration and a logo or something like very iconographic you know 
Mm-hmm. And then on top of that, the writing in Sin City, like, yeah, it's very specific kind of noir, manly sort of shit. And it's so well done. It's so good. When Frank Miller was on his peak uh, of writing and drawing, like, man, that was like, amazing to watch. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, he was he was one of those guys that had that singular vision, you know, and and that's what makes it so interesting is like if if an artist has that single vision, it almost it almost doesn't. Uh, well, if, if everything is serving like with Frank Miller, you know, his style is serving the story. Right. And it's such an iconic style. But it's not like what it is that people of that time would have thought, you know, if you had given that script to just like an into any other artist, uh, their interpretation of it would have been completely different than Frank's. Yeah. You know what I mean? It, it It's full of identity, basically. Like, I, I think the and the, there's there's also just quite a if you watch him doing daredevil and the stuff that he did for marvel you watch him going from very mainstream kind of marvel art like uh, house art styles down to what he became by the time he did and it's it's like quite a change and evolution but it's 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 all you're also watching an artist just kind of grow learn his craft and just also experiment you know like sometimes unsuccessfully but for the most part man like frank miller had a killer successful career as far as a lot of the work that he did and um he's he's still active but i think he's uh he's mostly writing and doing very few like illustrations um but but when he was in, in peak form like man even 300 was it's a, i it, I mean, it it made the storyboard for a great, uh, really fun movie. Like it's very stylized and very like again, it's it's Frank Miller. That's all. That's all you can say about it. Like so mm-hmm. much of his identity and, and what and the style that he became, both in writing and in, in visuals, it's it's all there, um, and mm-hmm. it's so strong. Um, yeah, I remember whenever we met in Japan, like uh, some of the other artists we were geeking out about was like uh, Robert Rodriguez. Ah, uh, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, because yeah. he did a great job translating that into a movie. Yeah. Like, the, the movies look great. Uh, yeah. Mm-hmm. But but that's yeah, also he's, why he's... they were great, because Frank Miller, uh, um, Robert Rodriguez was a huge fan of the comics, and he really admired and respected Robert, um, Frank Miller. So he just wanted to do just a just translation to that, you know. Um, Mm -hmm. I think for myself artistically, I I try to do that a lot too. Like if I get good concept art, I'm going to do my best to do it justice, you know, like to just make a really good translation of this to the image and to a 3D um, artwork. Uh, Respecting and whenever possible or necessary improving on the work, but... For the most part, I don't have the arrogance to be like changing too many things, you know, because for the most part, when you're working from a really good concept art, from a really good artist, like there's very few things to change or to fix. Um, I think a lot of artists in, in 3D make that mistake where if, um, if they start to do a 3D translation of a concept art, they change a lot of things or they ignore a lot of little details. And they lose a lot of the essence of what that art was, and uh, and you don't get a good translation of it um, because you are you're not understanding and and kind of respecting what made that artwork good and what that to the artist knows better than you graphically. I think so. It's it's important to kind of pay attention to a lot of these things and and just be true to them as much as possible. And I guess the benefit of that is also being a fan of the stuff it is that you're doing. And so you naturally, you respect it so much like this, this bio mutant. I never, I never heard anything about this game. I, I feel like this game came out and then it just went away in my mind. Yeah, it was, it's, it's sort of, uh, I, it's, I don't know if it's going to get a sequel. It might have, it might have not uh, done well enough to, 
to get a sequel. Mm -hmm. uh, but this um, this is one of those projects that is uh, is kind of adjacent to Darksiders because actually this was the first project that I did for the client that ended up being a client for Darksiders because this was a project for a, a publisher called THQ. Uh, and mm -hmm. THQ is a game publisher that owns uh, several game development companies. Um, or publishes games for several game companies. And this was actually a, a relatively new developer that THQ uh, published the, the game for. So this was actually a new IP, which happens rarely these days in, in video games or in movies. Mm -hmm. know, like new IPs are, are, are kind of risky and like, yeah, they can go well or they can kind of fail. Um, like I said, I still don't know if this game did well enough to, to get a sequel. But what I got out of it, of course, is that I did two, two pretty cool statues. Uh, the other statue that I did for this project is a diorama with two, the two characters coming at each other. That's actually one of the biggest uh, 3D statues that I've done also. Um, yeah, it's that one there. Uh, it, that thing is like half a meter oh. wide. <laughs> so it's, wow. it's pretty big. And um, the, from from that project, uh, from that same client, later came uh, um, the Darksiders project, where basically I did uh, one of the larger statues, and then I, I did the, most of the miniatures for, for the board game. And I, I basically uh, recruited two other sculptors to help me do the rest of the project, and they took the, they did the rest of the figures with my supervision. But, mm -hmm. but yeah, basically, it's like one project sometimes leads to the other, and uh, you learn all kinds of things from each project also. Yeah, yeah, I love the design in this game, and, and I feel like you you really nailed it. The the trailers and stuff I saw for Biomutant, I was like, oh my god, this game looks awesome! Like it looks like uh, you know a character based game that we would have saw like back on the PlayStation or something like that. Something that I, I feel like yeah. it isn't really a thing uh, and, anymore. And it yeah. was a decent open world game. My, my wife did more playthroughs of it than I did. She did like I three think. of them. I played it through once only. And uh, it was it was pretty alright, but but I I think it's such a tough competitive market also these days okay. that uh, you get a lot of crap movies and crap games, and you get yeah. still several good ones, but those good ones are fighting for for their dear life. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So I I gotta ask, like, what do you not to um, like? get into like a fear mentality but like what do you think is going to happen to your industry with like ai and and this sort of thing do you think that that's gonna is it going to radically change the way it is that that you do 3d sculpting do you feel like you're you're competing against something like a like a tidal wave or something that's coming for you you know what i mean or do you think that it's at just going to have it play. We're, we're mostly seeing it in 2D, of course, and it's it's kind of still we're still kind of seeing the effects of it and where it's going to go. Like I, I think that the um, the the tornado is still happening, and we're still not sure where the pieces are going to land for a lot of this. Um, yeah. I think it's going to take AI is going to take a bit longer to come for the 3D guys. But it will come, I guess, eventually. Um, mm -hmm. I think that wherever it lands for for two D art, um, I think it might still end up landing where it will take some jobs. It, but it also will change some jobs, and it will create some jobs, and it also will become a tool. Um, because I, I've, I I know and I've seen several two D artists that are using the uh, AI and training it with their own art to basically become more productive. So I think there's the where the chips are going to fall with, with AI and 2D, are, we're still witnessing what, what's going to go on there. Um, for a lot of artists that I know that are just really good 
and um, either have a really good client base or have a really particular style, uh, it's not affecting them at all. You know, like there are a lot of uh, artists that um, like maybe were worried for a second and then like, oh, it kind of passed. Um, I don't think it's over or settled yet. Um, but um, at least in, in my side in 3D, I'm, I'm not super worried or, or afraid. Um, I think also, even if it ended up becoming really good at both 2D and 3D, um, I don't think it will end up being a real reason for humans to stop uh, doing fun things like art, you know. Um, uh, someone was um, in my Discord server, they were bringing up um, color 3D printers and uh, they were wondering like, oh, is this going to make people stop painting miniatures? And it's like, well, no, I mean, like, just because we have, we have forklifts and we have uh, like machines that have the strength of 10 or 100 men, we, we still have to work out, we still lift and we still exercise and we still do sports. Like, yeah, you could develop a machine that can that can throw a, a pass like perfectly uh, on on uh, on the spot and at the, at the right speed and, and everything. Uh, but that that doesn't mean that the people that enjoy playing football and get really good at it and end up in the NFL, like, <laughs> they're, they're not going to stop, you know? So um, I think, yeah, you, you are going to see some, some changes, some adjustments, some of it. It will take down some jobs, but, but uh, I think it will also change and, and, and create some jobs also. So... Yeah, it se it seems like um, it seems like things have settled in the sense that like the public verdict on it is kind of in right. It's like you see it in the comments of like Instagram posts and stuff like that, where it's like people are like, "God, oh, this is just another freaking AI thing." You know what I mean? Like any anybody can do it, and so obviously, if anybody can do it, like the value of that is is really nothing. You know, um, yeah, yeah. and then you add on the you add on the um, the issues with OpenAI. I saw yesterday that uh, they had approached Scarlett Johansson about uh, using uh, OpenAI had approached Scarlett Johansson about using her voice for one of their programs. For okay. I guess the program is called Scott. <laughs> do you do you know what I'm talking about? Uh, well, she was the voice of the of the AI in the movie. Her. her. So yeah, I guess they're just mm -hmm. trying to uh, do what yeah. the movie was doing, basically, right? Yeah, yeah, and and so they were they were trying to get her to like be a part of it, and I guess that would you know that would be cool, right? To get the voice from her, but she said that she declined, and then uh, the whatever the software came out, Sky or whatever it is that they made, and it was still using her voice. And uh, so she had her legal team reach out and I guess she made a comment about it publicly. But I mean, like there's, it just seems like there's so much of that that's going on around like the AI stuff. Like it's, it's been shown now that like they were saying this whole time, it's like, oh, it's not trained off of living artists or anything like that. And that, oh, you know, come to find out that was, yeah, it was a complete lie, you know, like, there was like secret there was like emails or something that leaked where they had like lists they had like excel spreadsheets of like all the artists that they were basically scraping you yeah know? yeah yeah so it's it's interesting though i mean it is it is kind of cool in a sense like what it can do for sure yeah it is interesting mm -hmm. Yeah, man. Yeah, um, I mean, like, that's the other thing is that, like, we are we're watching both the the arms race of whoever comes up with the best one, but we're also gonna be seeing the ethics race, uh, mm -hmm. whatever is is uh, is legal and illegal to be to be doing with it. Um, and uh, yeah, I, I don't know where the chips uh, will will fall on that end uh, either. But yeah, we'll we'll find out, I guess. Yeah, cool, man. Well, um, 
I guess we're getting close to an hour. I don't want to hold you up for too long, but I do know you do like um, you do a Patreon and and you have like your own you have your own personal uh, it's your own personal IP, right? Uh, Raw. It's uh, it's my company, basically. So during the pandemic, I was kind of pushed into doing two of the things that I avoided for a long time while I was freelancing. So when mm -hmm. I was freelancing, um, some of my friends that um, that I worked with in other studios, um, a couple of them started their own studio, uh, for example. Like, it's, it's kind of, like, it's not the... the logical progression for everyone but for some people it's like you work at a studio and then maybe you freelance and then maybe eventually you start your own studio or, or with some friends you start a studio and uh, one of the reasons i left uh, working in uh, game development studios and like a lot of these places was that i, I kind of wanted my freedom back i wanted some freedom and i also wanted to, to, to be able to hold just one person accountable myself you know and not have to kind of deal with someone else's fuck ups or or also kind of be dependent on whatever might come to the company like in a studio you get of course the stability and the security that there will be a paycheck every month um but then you could end up in a situation where the studio signs for a project that you're going to hate for three years. <laughs> and, uh, and you're going to be doing stuff for this project for three years and you're stuck in there if, unless you uh, decide to leave. Um, and uh, when you're in the studio life, you need three things, basically. You need good projects, good people, and good money. You know? And you can have two out of those three and, um, and you're still going to be fine. If you just have one, like you can have a good project, but the people are terrible and the projects are, are, are terrible. Like good money is not enough to, like to put up with all yeah. that other shit. Um, and mm -hmm. it's basically the same with any other two uh, or three. So if, you, if you have good money and good projects and the people are kind of buttholes, like you're still kind of okay. You can put up with it. Um, but yeah, and if you have all three, you're doing great in a studio. And uh, so, so I kind of wanted the the freedom of just uh, kind of going solo for a while and just just kind of focusing on the things that I wanted to get better and get good at. And uh, freelancing really gave me that opportunity because I basically hyper focus, and that's part of when I made a lot of leaps in, in quality. Anyways, and um, but during the pandemic, I saw that the the industry was changing for what I was doing. Um, during my first few years freelancing between 2012 and 2020, um, I was basically getting a lot of clients that were doing miniature projects, and they were doing the production of those miniatures. And doing the production of those miniatures involves a lot of logistics and a lot of things that I didn't want to do, like warehousing, shipping, all of these other things that are just logistics and such a headache, especially with physical production. I, I wanted to avoid that. I didn't want to like, end up having to manage a warehouse and manage shipping uh, and all of these other things that, that come with uh, making miniatures or, or physical projects. And um, I also didn't want to like have to manage people again, um, which comes with, with, uh, with building a studio or starting a company and all these other things. Like I was kind of happy just on my own with a simpler life. Um, but then during the pandemic, I started seeing that a lot of the clients that were coming to me for projects were just studios that had a Patreon and they were just delivering digital goods. And at that point, I was like, well, these people are doing just things that I can do on my own. So I was like, screw it. I'm just going to do this on my own then. So I did both. And, and like the other, my other fear with starting a Patreon was that if you are a certain kind of artist and you start a Patreon, uh, you become a very specific rock band, let's say. Like if you, if you are... Um, Aerosmith, and you start to sound a little bit too much like Metallica or something along those lines, uh, your fans are gonna like hate it basically. You know, like 
Metallica is one of those bands that, that has experienced a lot of that, basically. Like, every time that they decided to experiment, like, you know? Um, yeah. And so, so that can happen to you also as a visual artist. If you are known for a certain kind of art or a certain kind of uh, style or figures, um, that can become the thing that, that like, people will pay you for and that they expect from you. And that can also be kind of... Uh, um, um, I guess like you lose some freedom there if, if you end up in a situation in certain situations along those lines so I, I was kind of careful about a Patreon about like kind of a situation like that but because of the pandemic and this kind of change in the industry I was like you know what Let's do it. Just give it a try you're going to do both now so I started a studio and I started a Patreon <laughs> And with all of the rep that I had gathered from doing figures for our clients and, and all kinds of projects, like basically I was able to bring some of the fans of that into my Patreon. And, but from the beginning, when I did this, when I started the Patreon, um, it was a Patreon that was offering multiple things that I knew were going to keep me interested and keep me excited about doing it. So I enjoy doing pinup art. And I enjoy doing fantasy art and even sci-fi art. So I was like, okay, I'm going to offer all of these things. It's going to be a, a kind of full uh, mixed bag that you're going to get each month on this Patreon. Um, and uh, if you like that, if you're up for that, then this is the place, you know? Uh, because a lot of the competition, a lot of the other Patreons are very specific. Like, they do mostly Wargaming or they do mostly d, &D um, or there are Patreons that are only pinups out there. So I'm doing a bit of all of them. Um, and with that, it, I'm basically building multiple IPs, actually. So we have... Uh, and I, one of my, my partners in the, in the studio venture is uh, Johannes Alvarez and uh, Jack. and uh, he's basically the, the guy in charge of doing a lot of the writing and a lot of the narrative design. So when we're doing D and D uh, compatible stuff, like he's the one that is kind of writing the lore and the names for that aspect. And then when we're doing sci-fi and we're doing um, cyberpunk, which is one of the like things that we like. We developed a few sci-fi figures, and there's a bit of a lore behind those uh, um, cyberpunk uh, figures. And but basically, all of these different lines of figures, they are sort of a testing ground for what eventually might be their own IPs. So the most substantial substantial catalog that we have at the moment is our fantasy catalog and so basically it's a fantasy catalog of miniatures that are compatible with D&D but they're also independent from D&D so they're just also their own um, I wouldn't say generic but they're, they're are, they are their own uh, fantasy IP that has a lot of commonalities with what everyone knows about fantasy IPs and uh, so there are dragons, there are monsters, there are heroes, there are villains, all of these things. Um, and they're all kind of done with the, with the flavor that we're trying to, to bring into, into things. And the, the flavor, uh, I like some of our own patrons have described it as, as a, a bit like vanilla WoW. Like WoW, World of Warcraft, when it was in the early stages. Um, and that suits us perfectly fine. I think it's also mixed a little bit with uh, Dark Siders and um, and a few other things. Like for sure, basically a lot of the projects that I've worked, that I've done for clients, like Street Fighter, I think even some of that flavor is, is kind of mixed into the kind of thing that we're doing with our different IPs. And uh, there is one um, IP that. Uh, much slow, much more slowly developing, and that uh, is sort of the namesake of the company. The, the company is called Ronin Arts Workshop, and uh, mm -hmm. it, it, it happens to shorten into Raw, basically. Um, mm -hmm. And that uh, is basically 
the the name has uh, yeah it has it has that logo that was uh, done by a friend of mine. He mm -hmm. had this really cool mascot samurai for for us, and uh, and basically he is the the first of of, of a set of of samurai and ronin characters that will be also developing down the line. Like that is eventually I would want it to be sort of the flagship IP of of the company. Um, mm -hmm. But uh, depending on how how things develop, of course, like any if any of the IPs that we are working with and, and putting together kind of ends up taking off in in, a, in another way down the line, like of course we're we're happy to, to see that. This is, for example, part of our cyberpunk characters, and this is uh, what we call raw reset. And uh, yeah, this guy is like a street samurai in a very cyberpunk 2077 sort of way, you know. Um, yeah. So so yeah, and I, I'm I'm a fan of so many things out there. Like I've grown up with so much pop culture from the U.S. in my brain, and so much anime from Japan. Mm -hmm. um, that it's all kind of made a big jumble of things that I enjoy and that I can basically. Uh, <laughs> Um, be making things uh, for or, or similar to that mm -hmm. is, is just um, this is a lot of fun basically because the, the cool thing about this of course is that these are ours now these belong to raw these belong to to, uh, to the company and um, and with the company I get to collaborate with a lot of artists out there like if I find an artist that has cool pinups on Twitter like i might just hit them up and be like hey i really like this pinup that you did like would you let us license it for for some miniatures and for the most part like they they say yes and so we we basically end up doing a lot of collaboration with uh, artists out there like this guy for example was designed by a, a friend of mine that uh, i met here in in austria um and he's uh, he's a concept artist from indonesia so he designed some of these guys for us and um, yeah, so we we are doing a bit of everything basically with with raw, and um, it's it's a lot of fun. It's becoming more and more sustainable as, as it goes uh, as it goes on. Because the first year, uh, it was mostly me hiring uh, a bunch of artists that I could barely afford and just kind of not paying myself for the first year. And then <laughs> now basically mm -hmm. the second year and the third year. We're in the we're starting basically what is the first year now. And uh, like things are a lot more stable. We're able to to um, uh, to afford kind of more concept art and more collaborations. Um, and the uh, the back catalog is also generating some, some significant revenue for us. So, so it's 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 been a lot of effort. It's been a lot of work to kind of build the, the foundations of it and set it up. Um, but I'm I'm really I've really enjoyed the creative freedom of it. Like there's there's nothing like it. Like it's it's fun to work on IPs that you love, like Street Fighter and all of these things. Um, mm -hmm. But uh, for me, at least, it's, it's even more fun to just create on some uh, create something entirely new that you are either coming out entirely from you or that you're collaborating with someone else that like you both or or the team is birthing some new thing that you're gonna throw out there into the world and see how it does, see how it goes. Yeah, totally, man. Cool, man. Well, uh, we reached a little over an hour. Uh, so we'll go ahead and we'll wrap it up here. I'm going to include your Patreon and like all your links to your art station and stuff like that uh, down below. Uh, but thank you, man. Thank you for taking your time. I know you're a busy guy, but I, I appreciate the hangout. And like I said, your stuff is super inspiring to me, man. Like I, I just I love seeing people who are killing it. I, f I feel like there's a lot of naysayers out there. They're like, oh, you know, the art jobs are going away or whatever. Um, but they're they're clearly not. No, um no, and like no, you said you know i mean so stay. much of it comes down to like that that raw skill and when i see somebody who's like who's just like maxed out there it's almost like you maxed out your character stats for doing 3d <laughs> like even though i don't i don't do 3d it's still it's like it's it's super cool it's super inspiring man so thank you thanks for having me man yeah, yeah. cool and uh thanks for everybody watching 
uh, feel free to leave a like and comment and uh, take care, guys.